Okay, I don't think this thing is going to work. You get, you get, get here on a Sunday morning, it says, accessory needs to update, otherwise it's not going to work when you plug it in, and you know you've got problems. So, <laughs> unfortunately, you're not going to have anything up there this morning, unless if it suddenly just pops up. Uh, technology sometimes gets you. But that's okay, because that's not what's important. What's important this morning is that God is here. We've had some time to worship Him, reflect on, on what He wants to say to us, and just enjoy some time in His Word this morning. So we're excited about that. I'm sure that many of you have heard many, many sermons about serving God. I'm sure that if you look back on your every single sermon that you've ever heard, you could probably count quite a few sermons that you've heard about serving God, about taking an opportunity to serve in some way. Um, maybe in the church, maybe getting involved in, in what God is doing in the church, maybe um, outside of the church, in the community, or with the church in the community, or whatever it might be, using your gifts to serve, using your time to serve. I'm sure that all of us, and I, I can look back and I know that I've preached quite a number of sermons where we've spoken about serving God. Eh, Garth? Probably quite a few. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, once you get past 60, then you just, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's such an important thing. And I think every single one of us want to be that person who, who is standing out and saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, use me. We want to be that person who who's out there saying, yes, I want to, I'm, I'm serving, I'm, I'm living for God, I'm being obedient to God. We want to stand out. We want our, our lives to count. We want people to say good things about us when, when they're speaking you know, about us and we're not there. We want people to say good things about us when we're no longer here in this world and we've passed on. We want people to, to say good things. We want to stand out. The problem is, is that I think sometimes we want this so bad because we, we follow God, we've chosen to follow Him, and that's what we, we're supposed to be doing. Because that's what we're here for. And I think sometimes we want this so bad, and we want people so badly to see that we're standing out and we're doing something for God, that we actually are willing to fake it and settle for something far short of what God wants for us. And a lot of times we, we're so desperate to be that person, that even before God, we're willing to fake it, and we end up coming very far short of where God wants us to be. There's a story in the Old Testament about King Saul. And God told him, I want you to go, and I want you to take out this evil, wicked nation. They, they were a really terrible nation, and I want you to go to war with them, and I want you to sort them out. And when you sort them out, nothing must remain. Don't keep anything. Don't keep any of the livestock. Just destroy it all. So what does Saul do? He goes, and he destroys them, and he, he sees that they've got some good livestock and some good things to keep. And so he, he takes that, and he holds on to it. And then what he does is he takes... One of the animals, or some of the animals, and he, he builds an altar, and he puts the animal on the altar and as a sacrifice to God. And Samuel comes and he rebukes him. Because he says, you know what? What you have done is, is wrong. What you have done is evil. You are faking it. You're making this big show of, of sacrifice and surrender. And, and a lot of times we want people to see, man, we've sacrificed for God. And I think sometimes even in the ministry, it's, 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 it's a temptation to, to want people to see, man, look at what we've given up. I wanted to be a, a CEO or, or, or an accountant when I started out. And, 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 and what if we sacrificed for God? We want people to see that. And Samuel comes and he says, you know what? Obedience is better than sacrifice. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much you sacrifice. It doesn't matter how much you do. It doesn't matter all the good things you do if you're not being obedient to God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Service is all good and well, and it's important. And I, and I know this because there's many times when God has led me to share on just challenging people to serve Him. But it only counts if we do it right, if we do it in the right way. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I believe it's what Jesus was trying to get through to, to a group of, of people, and in particular, the Pharisees who were in that group that day, when He told them a parable that I want to read together and that parable is found in Matthew chapter 21. So if you've got your Bibles, I hope you do. You should be bringing your Bibles to church, even though it's up there on the screen. So you can pull out your Bibles or you can pull out your Bible app, whatever you use, and follow along. But we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 21 and verses 23 to 32 together. And I want to speak this morning about two types of service. Because there is a, there is a right way to serve God and there is a wrong way to serve and I want to have a look at that together. Matthew chapter 21 and starting at verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts 
And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who, gives you, who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Then he begins this parable. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. But John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Father, I, I just pray that as we spend this time in your word, just soaking in this parable, this, this discussion on serving you, it's a critical thing. Because that's what we're here for. And Father, so often our attitudes and our hearts are not where they ought to be. And, and Lord, I just pray that you would challenge us this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts to you. That we might be real before you in this place. Because you see everything. You know every thought. You know every worry. You know every concern. And so I pray as we focus on this today that you would speak to us in a powerful way. Amen. So Jesus here was challenging in particular. I'm sure there were other people in the crowd and his disciples were probably there. But he was, as he began this parable, looking at what had just happened with the Pharisees and how they were trying to trick him. And Jesus was brilliant. This is probably the most clever response that I've ever heard of in my life. It is just fantastic. And he's challenging these chief priests and elders. And these people, just a bit of background on them, they made up the bulk of the Sanhedrin, which was basically the leadership uh, and, and the spiritual leadership, but they also led um, in many other aspects. And, and, and these people made up the bulk of the Sanhedrin. And there's a couple of things about them. Most of them were Pharisees, and the Pharisees were known for living up to the requirements of the law, absolutely perfectly. And even Christ recognizes, he says in Matthew 5 verse 20, unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. So he said, you know what, this is, this is a standard that these guys are able to live up to. Not only that, they were respected by the people. The people, it's actually important to realize that unlike the, 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 the high priest and his sagan or his, his deputy, these, the, the, these guys were actually chosen by the people. And that's another important thing to realize, that they were elected by the people. And so people would, would, would consider them worthy to be in that position. And so they were respected by the people. The people loved them. They respected them. They looked up to them. They wanted to, to mirror their lives. They were known for their dedication and commitment. And people looked at them as having the ability to live lives that were above reproach. And, and, and these are all the characteristics of these people that had come to Jesus and asked him this question. And if, this, if these were the characteristics of the chief priests and the elders, then I, I wonder why it is that throughout the Gospels, they are spoken of in such a negative way. And every time that Jesus came across them, he challenged them. He got quite aggressive with them. In fact, in just a few verses earlier, he was taking out his whip and he was sorting them out. He called them uh, snakes and vipers and all sorts of things. These were respected people. And here was this young man between the ages of 30 and 33, and he was taking them out. He was sorting them out. And, 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 and one kind of wonders, what is it? How is it that, that he could do this to such respected people in the community? And I think the answer is quite simple. It's found in his most common phrase for them, hypocrite. 
And we, we hear that word and we're like, ooh, ooh, hypocrites, you know, that scary stuff. I don't, you know, I don't want to be, and, and, and today we look at the Pharisees, oh, those were terrible people, but they weren't. And I think for every single one of us, we could probably relate to these guys because they, they, the word quite simply is an actor. That's what a hypocrite is. It's, a, it's someone who can act. And that doesn't sound so bad anymore, an actor. A lot of people have their favorite actors. And, 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 and something I've noticed these days has become quite a common trend for musicians to now start acting. Have you noticed that? Like all the, the big uh, musicians now want to go into acting. And quite honestly, most of them are not quite on the same level as your actor-actors, you know? But it seems to be a common trend these days. Everyone wants to act. If you, even if, you, if you've never done any acting, everyone acts. And they don't do a bad job. And you know what it shows me? That in actual fact, all of us, all of us have the ability to act. I'm pretty sure that everyone here, and I know for myself it is true, that we can fool people. We can make people believe something that isn't there. It's, we actually are masters of illusion. And so we don't need to look at the Pharisees and say, man, they were bad, bad people. No, all that had happened for them is that they had learned how to fool people. They had learned how to trick people into believing something that wasn't there. Now, I had a really cool um, illusion uh, that I was going to show you that is now gone. But fortunately, we were at a children's ministry conference this morning, so I'll try and do something with some paper, and hopefully I remember it right. Who was at the children's ministry conference? Right. So, who, who likes magic tricks and illusions? All right. Now, what's the thing about magic tricks is that they are not real. It's an act. All right. And so it doesn't actually happen. But who can, who, who, who can make a hole in this paper and then get Garth to fit through that hole? <laughs> You know the trick, eh? <laughs> so you're out. <laughs> no, no people know the trick. <laughs> well, anyone who doesn't know the trick like to try. Got to spare a piece of paper. Just got to make a hole, and, and without tearing the outside of the hole, you got to put it over God. Anyone want to try? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we'll see what we can do. I, I don't even have a pair of scissors. So I just had to, I was running around before the service, like, what am I going to do now? My illustration's gone, <laughs> so we'll see. But anyway, um, you can see this is just an ordinary piece of paper, and we're going to tear it a little bit here, and we're going to see if we can get it around God. But this is, they had some actually pretty cool uh, illusions and magic tricks and all sorts of things like that, and um, I, I, I enjoy it, because, you know, I think at the end of the day, we actually want to be fooled. And so it's so easy to fool people around you. And this is not looking as elegant as it would if I had some scissors, but we'll go for it. Now, let's just see golf. Measurements here. <laughs> All right. And cut a bit there. Just have a look over here. You're getting nervous. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to make, I'm, I'm making this an extra large one. Just so <laughs> <laughs> XXL. <laughs> okay. A few more. And we will be good to <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can have a big enough hole in this paper. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Maybe not quite. Oh, huh? yeah. oh well, we'll leave it over here as a necklace because it looks so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The other illusion was pretty cool, but you know, the thing with illusions is it's not real. And and one of the things that that video that I had, and what, you can you can come and look at it after the service, pretty cool. Um, we have become. It just shows that we have become masters as human beings, of fooling other people. And we are no different in the church today. I think every single one of us can relate to this, can relate to, to being so desperate to be the one who is serving God that we're willing to make it something that it isn't. We're willing to put on an act and do something. And the Pharisees, they were just actors. That was their fault. That was their mistake. And they hadn't been exposed. And that was why they got so aggressive towards Christ when he exposed them all the time. And he challenged them with a simple parable. 
So let's have a look at it this morning, because I believe that this applies to us. This is not a parable that was told just for the Pharisees' sake, you know, so many years ago, and we don't need to even look at it today. It's something that really applies to us, because we can still put on a show today. And I want us to, to look, first of all, at the Father's request. The parable starts off with his father, and he goes to his, his son, his, the, the first son that's there, and he gives him a request. He says, son, I want you to go and work today in the vineyard. And I want us to see a couple of things about this request. The first being is that, and this is an obvious thing, but it's significant, is that it was the request of a father. Now, Jesus was telling a parable. He was telling a story to illustrate a point, which means that he could have chosen any story. He could have chosen any illustration because the story isn't important. The illustration isn't important. I had to quickly change illustrations. Doesn't matter. Same point. The point is what is important. So he could have chosen any story. He could have chosen a story about a, a master and his two slaves. Will, will you go and work in the vineyard? He could have told a story about a master and two servants, people who were hired to do the job. He could have even told a story about a man and his two companions. Hey man, why don't you just help me out today? I need some help working in the vineyard. He could have done that. But he decides to tell the story about a father and his two sons. And it's, it's significant that this request to work in the vineyard came from a father. Firstly, because it represents God, who's our heavenly father. But I think it's also important because there's something special about a father's request, isn't there? I mean, when a slave is asked to do something, if he doesn't do it, he could lose his life. If a servant is asked to do something, if he doesn't do it, he could not get paid at the end of the day and, and, and suffer. If a, if, if, if a companion is asked to do something, normally they'll be like, yeah, you know, I'll do that for you, but then it just doesn't come quite high up on the priority list. Ever happened to you? You ask a friend to do something, it doesn't get done, and it doesn't get done, and it doesn't get done. But the fact is, is that it was the Father's request, and, and comes with that an authority that it needs to be done, but at the same time, the love and companionship. It, it's all there together in that request. There's something special about it. A father's request. It's not just some insignificant thing when the father says to us, I need you to go into the vineyard and do something for me. I need you to go out there and make a difference for me. It's not just some insignificant request. And it's not on the other hand, this God who's saying, you will go. I'm going to take you by the collar and you're going to sort those people out and you're going to, you know. It's not like that at all. It is the request of a father coming with all the authority and all the love the same time. Second thing about it is that it was a request to work. To work, to toil, to labor. These are not words that we like the sound of, right? In fact, I've even heard in some households, that if, if you say that word, that work word, it's like a swear word. We don't say that word in our home. That's a filthy, dirty word. We don't use that in our home kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe not to that extreme, but we, we don't react very well when we hear the word work. We don't like that word often. But the request of the Father is to work. And we all know what is involved with work. It takes time. It takes a sweat of our brow. It takes hard work. It takes effort. One of the things we were challenged with in the conference yesterday was creativity. And, 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 and that takes time. And that takes effort to put in and to work for God. And we're not here on earth as Christians just to pass the time and survive until we're taken up to heaven. That's not what we're here for. We're here to work, actually. We've got a job to do. To do the work of the Father in building His kingdom. And I believe that that's represented in the story in the vineyard. That we go out and often in Scripture, vines and vineyards and fruit is spoken of in terms of the kingdom of God. If we're not involved in building up the kingdom of God and it being about His business, then basically we've chosen the root of the second son. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. So I believe that we are called to work, and I believe that we're not only called to work, but it's scriptural, and it's taught throughout scripture that we need to do it skillfully. We need to do it with passion, with energy, with thought, with vision. When you go and plant a vineyard, and I've been, I've been told this, it's not an easy thing to do. You can't just go and, and throw a few seeds and just leave it like that. It's not, you can't just do it any old how. You need to ask the right questions. You need to say, well, what is the climate like? Can I grow these, these, this plant here? What are the what are the pests that there are to get rid of? What do I need to know about that? Hey, hey, you guys, you know, right? Am I getting this right? What, sort out the pests and all that. What is the soil condition like? 
You know, we need to ask the questions. What is, what is the environment like so that we can do the best job? There are specific needs for growing the vineyard. And so it is with the kingdom of God. We, we can't just go and build it any old house. We need to ask ourselves, what is the best and most effective and most relevant way of building the kingdom of God here in this place, in Hatis? Because I've been all over different places. And I have seen, we can even, as we, as we looked at what the Camerons are doing, I'm, I'm betting that they don't do things the way we do things here. Because it's different. Because we need to know the conditions. Because we need to know the best thing in our area to be relevant. And a lot of people say, oh, no, that's not spiritual. That's, that's all practical stuff. You don't need to plan. Just, just kind of waltz along and go with the flow, and God will tell you what to do, that kind of attitude. But let me ask you this question. Who makes a plant grow? Well, what makes a plant grow? I think I gave it away. <laughs> Who makes a plant grow? God. So does that mean we just leave the plant? We don't water it. We don't worry about it. Just leave it. Don't think about it. Don't plan don't check the soil. No, we can't do that. We have to be intentional. And so it is with us here, serving God. We've got to be intentional. We've got to give it thought. We've got to give it energy. That's the way to serve. That's the request that's coming from the Father to you and me today. That we need to be intentional about what we do. But having said this, what I love about this request as well, on the other side of it, is that it's not outcomes based. We're called to do the best that we can. We're called to be intentional and, and put every effort in it. But, but it's not outcomes based. The father didn't say to his sons, go and work in the vineyard, and by the end of the day, I need six bottles of wine all sorted out. <laughs> he didn't give them a measurement. And he doesn't do that with us. He simply says, go and put, put, put everything in. I know when you're giving 70%. That's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they said they were giving 100, but they weren't. I know. <laughs> I can see. He wants us to give out everything. But sometimes we become a, a, a bit obsessed in the church and in ministry about, you know, what, what, are, what are the outcomes? What are the results? What are the numbers? What are the figures? I remember one time I went out with a group of missionaries uh, from, from the, the States where there were a few missionaries with our, with our team that was ministering in the area. And we were speaking in a setting where the, 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 the people who, who were listening to us didn't understand any English. We knew that because we tried to communicate with them. And one of the the missionaries got up and he spoke a whole message in English. And then he gave an altar call at the end. And he said, who would like to accept Jesus? And they're like looking at him. And so he said, you know, like this, put up your hand. And so they all thought, okay, well, I better put up my hands. Everybody put up their hand. Everyone was waving their hands. And the, the cameras were going, look, oh, we saved all these people today. Come on. <laughs> really? we become so focused on outcome when it's not about that. It's about saying, you know what? Whether it's one person, or whether it's a hundred people, or whether it's a thousand people, I don't care. Whatever God tells me to do today, I'm going to do. Sometimes we, 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 we get the results of Jeremiah where nobody listens. He was the worst evangelist. <laughs> no one listened to him. But we are being obedient. We are where God wants us to be. Now come the responses of the sons. Now there are two sons. This gives the implication here that there are two responses to God's calling to serve him. Two types of people in the family of God. Not multiple, not multiple responses, nothing in between. It's actually quite cut and dry. There's just two. Which means that every single one of us fit into either one category or the other right now. And you know what I've found in my life is that sometimes I've been the one son and sometimes I've been the other. So it's not a case of, man, if I fit into the wrong category today, I'm, what am I going to do? This is terrible. <laughs> But sometimes we have to take an honest look at ourselves and say, where am I right now? Because I'm, I'm either one or the other. I'm either serving God passionately in, in the right way, or I'm not. And so let's get the negative out the way. I know it's the second response is the negative, but it's in on of high note, shall we? <laughs> All right, so let's get the negative out of the way. Three things about the first response, the first son. The first, that it was insincere. If you have a look at the verse where, where, where the father says to the first son, will you go? You'll notice that the, the son says no, and then he changes his mind. It specifically says he changed his mind, and then he went. The second son, it says that he said yes, and then he didn't go. There was no he changed his mind. He never intended to go. Right from the beginning, he was being insincere and dishonest. And this would have related to exactly to what the Pharisees were doing at that time, because it was an act. 
It was insincere. It wasn't real. And like the chief priests and the elders, he had learned the secret of the act. And I'm convinced that in, in, in our churches today, it is far too easy to learn that. And that's a sad reality. Too many Christians who like the priests and the elders maybe feel that, you know what, people respect me, people look up to me. And I, I've got to live up to that. I've got to impress. And so instead of being real, we put on an act. We stop being real with other, with other people. We stop being real with God. I've noticed this with new Christians. Often you'll get someone who's, who's just come to know Christ. And they, and they don't have a problem with being real. Man, I'm a sinner. We had, had someone like that two weeks ago when I was on a mess. It was a, a guy who said, I'm the chief of, I'm the chief of sinners. Well, so refreshing. <laughs> you know? And somehow, as we become to know, as we start to know what a Christian is supposed to look like, Instead of being real and saying, I want that, but I want God to do it in me, we put on an act. And we show people that, but it's not real. I want to ask this morning, have you learned that? If you haven't, please don't learn it. (laughs) Don't be a good actor. Rather be who you are. With all your mistakes, with all your flaws, with all your issues, to be able to say, God is doing a work in me, and He has not finished yet. To, being, to committing to saying this morning, I want to be honest with God, I want to be honest with people. I want to find people in my life that I can be honest and do what needs to be done. The second thing about his response is that he was immovable. He had no intention of doing the will of the Father. He made up his mind, he wasn't going to change it. And sometimes we behave like that towards God. God says, I want you to do something, and we, we say, I'm not going to do that. When we're around other people, we might say, oh, well, you know, I'll think about it, or I'll pray about it. If we get a spiritual, I'll pray about it. But in our minds, no ways. It's not going to happen. And I want to ask this morning, are you willing to bend to his will, or have you already made up his mind? I mean, made up your mind. Maybe think for a moment this week, your decisions. What percentage, and you don't have to answer this out loud, but in your mind, what percentage of those decisions were God led? this week. I know we do a lot of practical things and we don't need to necessarily you know, be asking God every five minutes, should I do this, should I do this, that kind of thing. But you know, even the most unspiritual practical things, we can give to God. And I wonder how many of our decisions, especially our important decisions, were godly this week? Or are we immovable? Are we so stubborn in the way that we do things, in the way that we want things, in, in the way that we act, that we just, we just do it our way. And then the last thing is that it was insubordinate. It was actually, he was just being plain disobedient. In another parable, Jesus describes a disobedient man like one who built his house on a sand. There's no basis. There's no solid foundation. And it all starts when we learn the secret of the act. When we learn how to put on a show. When we become the Hollywood stars of the church. First we deceive people. Then we try and deceive God. Of course we can't do that, but we think we are. But most tragically, I think, is that then we even deceive ourselves. At the end of the day. And we can't do that. We can't put on an act. Is there a rubbish bin over there? I want to just grab it quickly. I hope there's nothing too bad in here. So I think for many of us, we walk around with our, our rubbish bin, our recycle bin, if you into computers, you know? And we, we walk around with this, and we've got stuff, and we try as much as we can to hide it, and we try as much as we can to, 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 to fake it, and, and yet we've got all of this stuff that is inside of us, that is undoubted. And it's never going to get dealt with. It's going to sit there and it's going to rot and it's going to smell bad until we deal with it, until we are real with God. We're never going to to be able to deal with it. And and I don't know how many of you have ever had that situation where where you're at home for a day and everything seems fine in the house and then you go outside and you come back inside and you realize, man, that, that rubbish bin is not smelling good right now. And we get so used to the smell that we actually don't even realize that there's a problem. And we convince ourselves 
There's nothing in there. And that's the worst tragedy of all. We've convinced everyone else. We thought we've convinced God, and then we convince ourselves. I was having a discussion the other day, and, and we were just talking uh, about it. Uh, the, the question was asked, how can people who are following God, who love God, who are passionate about God, do, do such terrible things? Because we all experience it. Because they have convinced themselves that there is nothing in there. And that everything is fine. And they believe it with all their hearts. We need to be real. If, if we can learn anything from that son, that second response, it's simply this, we need to be real. But let's move on to the positive, because that's good. Let's look at the second, the first son. His response, first of all, we'll go to the seeds. We were in the eyes before, let's go to the seeds. His response, first of all, was candid. It was honest. In, it, it's totally distinctive from the other son. He was honest. He didn't try to create a better picture of himself before the father. Did you notice how the second son says, I will go serve, very respectful, exactly what you would expect a son to be. This son says, no, I'm not going to do that. And we think, oh, how can he do that? And I'm pretty sure in those times it was even more, so how can he behave like this? But you know what? He was just being honest. He was just being open. He was truthful with himself. I don't want to go. He was truthful with God. And I think when God says to you, this is what I want you to do, I think the first response needs to be honest. Because if we don't start there being real, we end up here carrying a huge heap of rubbish around us and actually hurting other people along the way with it. We need to be absolutely honest. And he was truthful. He said, you know what, I don't want to do this. And I think, what's the point of being dishonest with God? When he says, why don't you do something for me? To be able to say, listen, I don't, I don't feel like I can do this. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm shy. I, I, I don't want to go out there. I, I, I don't have the time. Or even just to be even bluntly honest, I don't want to do this, actually. Because God sees it anyway. We need to be honest with God. It's so, so important. There are so many people who, who say, yes, here I am, I will go, I will serve. They stand up, they say, yes, I want to do it. How many of these responses are followed through? At the end of the day, the temptation is so strong to show people that we're living the life, the, the, the right life, that we live a lie. This son was open with the father. This son said exactly what he thought to the father. He was real about it. You know, growing up in a pastor's home, it's actually even more difficult not to act. It's one of the things, because everyone's looking at you as the kids, and how will the kids of this pastor turn out, you know, kind of thing. And I, I kind of, you know, I saw exactly what it meant to be a pastor. But when I left school, in the back of my mind, God was calling me into ministry, calling me into pastoral ministry. So what did I do? I said, I don't want to do that. And I, I, I went to two different firms, Ernst & Young, Deloitte and, Deloitte and Tush, and I got accepted by both. Great, that's what I want to do. I want to become a CEO, I want to make lots of money, I want to be successful. That's, that's how I want to Don't want to do that, though. And then I saw these fusion teams, these Baptist youth teams come, and I was trying to decide between the two, and I was even being spiritual about it. Let me pray about this and think about this. And, and I decided, let me try this team thing out for a year. And I went to the interview. And the, the team director who was there, his name is Salwan, he said, you know, I, I, I have a sense that God is calling you into some kind of full-time ministry. And I said, I know that I, I, I sense it in my heart that I'm supposed to be a pastor. At the end of the year... What did I do? At the end of the first year of team, got hold of Ernst Young and made an application, got accepted again. <laughs> then they called me back as a leader. I said, why don't you come back as a leader? Okay, well, that's a little bit of a you know, detour in my plans, but no problem. And then during that year, church approached me and said, would you come and be a youth pastor, student youth pastor, study, study through correspondence, come to PE, come to Trinity Baptist, and do that. It took me a while, but at the end of that, I accepted the call. I'm so thankful that I was honest with God. 
I'm so thankful that I was real with God because it would have been so easy for me to follow in my father's footsteps and do exactly what I'd always known my whole life. But when I made that decision, it was my decision before God. I was being obedient to him. I wasn't being fake. I wasn't trying to put on a big show and say, look at me, super spiritual kind of thing. I wasn't. I was disobedient at first. I didn't want to do it at first. That's what we've got to be. We've got to be real. But there comes a point in time where we also have to be convicted. We can be as honest as we like, but if we don't have a change of heart, and this is what's so important and so key in this verse, that he changed his mind. That as he was caring about his business, going on with his business, he realized there's something wrong here. I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And he had a change of heart. And that's so, so important. He was challenged by his lack of desire to serve and realized that he needed to do the will of the Father. And so I asked, first of all, is your life a life of honesty, a life of openness? But secondly, is your life a life of conviction? That in your honesty, in your openness, you are ready, in fact, you are waiting to be convicted. And not just, you know, early on in your walk with God, but throughout your walk with God. We've never arrived. I want to be convicted all the time. I want to be challenged all the time. Are your attitudes, thoughts, and actions constantly changing as you walk with God? And I know it's a difficult thing to do, but there's a couple of thoughts I have on it. And the one is that I think it's important, daily, if we can, to take moments in our, in our busy schedule to just pause. We can even say it's our pause moment in the day. I want to pause now. It would be nice if we could pause everyone else as well. Pause the cell phones, pause, pause people. <laughs> don't pause someone when they're in the middle of talking. You don't want to <laughs> hear what they have to say. But just to pause, to find a quiet moment and to say to God, Lord, what are the things in my life that you are unhappy with? So that we are open to conviction. I heard once of a guy who, who, who was driving home and he got home and he felt so, he, he felt the desire that he, and this was someone I knew, he spoke to me about his experience. He said he felt a desire to just come before God and ask the Holy Spirit, what is it in my life that you don't like? And he spent like half an hour in the car because the Holy Spirit was just, he had to write it down eventually. He said, these are the things I want you to deal with. Most of the things on his list, he said, he would never have known himself. Sometimes we need the power of the Holy Spirit, his insight to be able to see the things in our life that need to change. We need to have a life of conviction. And then last of all, I want us to see, in comparison to the second son, that this first son was compliant. He may not have initially wanted to serve the Father. He was real. He was honest. He's a fallen human being. But at the end of the day, he chose to obey, to live a life of obedience. And I want us to realize this morning that he would never have come to that point if he hadn't dealt with the issues. And we need to do that. And I hope there's nothing really, really bad in here. But we need to, we need to take those pause moments, right? So we can say, right, we're going to just empty this up. <laughs> this is tough, eh? It's not easy to do, but we've got to do it. Even if it means I've got to clean up afterwards. We've got to empty that stuff out. And you know what? Whoop. No, there's still things in there. Right. We've got to get rid of the rubbish. We've got to get rid of the, the stuff that we've been hiding from everybody. Right? Because we've been unreal. We've been actors. Maybe we even need to say, you know what, I'm not even going to carry this bin around because I don't even want a place to put that stuff in anymore. Because <laughs> we don't just deal with sin as Christians. We've got to deal with our sinful attitude as well. I'm going to clear it out. I'm going to take that pause moment. Maybe, maybe for some of us, that's exactly what we need to do today. As we go home, as we've heard the word of God, and we say, you know what, there are certain things in my life that I'm just putting on a show for people. It's not real. It's just an act. They think this about me, but it's not true. And I want to get rid of that stuff, for real. As painful, as difficult as it might be, I want to see that stuff gone in my life. Jesus ends off with an obvious question. He says, which one of the sons did the will of the Father? And we know the answer. Everyone there knew the answer. It was the first son. Why did Jesus ask such an obvious question? 
Because he wanted the people who were listening to him to consider their own hearts. To say, well, which son am I? Where do I stand as my service to God? Because we can do all these amazing things in the eyes of men and be doing nothing for God. Absolutely nothing for Him at the end of the day. God is calling for honest, convicted, obedient workers who will go out into the harvest fields with passion, with commitment and vision. So at this point in time, as you look at your own life, which son are you?